microscopic analysis of shark skin. Most of it is done with uh, electron microscopy. A study in biomimicry, which has become sort of a, I don't know, a sideline slash passion of mine for the last couple of years. And just to we segue into this, uh, that is a Galapagos shark on your upper, your upper right. And uh, if you sort of look toward the tail fin area, later on I'll be referring to the caudal peduncle, basically uh, where the body ends and the tear begins to flail. That's a common anatomical structure called the caudal peduncle. And I took all my specimens from there, so there was some commonality. So I won't have to go back to that picture. What you're seeing below it is, of course, a skinning electron micrograph of shark skin. It's not the same. That's tiger shark as opposed to uh, nurse shark. But nevertheless, all shark denticles are unique to that species, but they're all different from one another. And that's kind of uh, where we begin. Uh, how I got into working with sharks was many moons ago, I lived in California, and I was working on leopard sharks, which are harmless, even though the name uh, sounds rather rough. And uh, they're easy to spot, no pun intended, because they are spotted, right? They're leopard sharks. But most species, as you probably know, are sort of a uniform gray. There's the outliers, blue sharks, tiger sharks. But most of them are sort of a uniform gray. And what most people don't know or didn't know at the time is that sharks reproduce very, very slowly. They grow slowly. It takes them, you know, 20, 28, 30 years to reach the mature age. And they have a relatively low fecundity anyway. They put out, you know, four or five, maybe 15 pups compared to bony fishes. They're going to crank out hundreds of thousands of embryos. So it doesn't take long to decimate a population of animals that take a long time to reach breeding size and breed with, again, a low fecundity. Sharks were endangered even way back when, and this is getting into the later 70s. So the Department of Fish and Game, sometimes they get things right. I put these on. Sometimes they get things right, and they put a moratorium on fishing for certain shark species. And, of course, when sharks are captured for the fishery, the first thing people do is cut the head off because, the, as you probably know, the heart is in the lower jaw. That's where all the blood pulls up, and that's where all the urinary taste would come from. Cut off the head. Without the head there and no teeth, it becomes difficult to tell shark A from shark B from shark C. Unless you look at two things. You can do a little molecular biology sample, wait about four or five days to get your results back, and then find the fishermen. Uh, or you could look at their teeth, which again are absent, but as it turns out, the teeth look just like the denticles. So you have this little micro version of teeth that can be used for identity. So where I started this was working up a series of SEMs of the denticles, and a friend of mine who's one of these physicist app you know, one of the entrepreneurs is going to develop an app that will simply take these scanning electron micrographs, which you could get by a quick fillet, 30 minutes later have your image, compare it with an app, and it will spit out like a Peterson's field guide, what species it is. That's where all of this began. Um, but it's taken off since then. Okay. So what I want to talk to you today was, well, why shark skin? I've given you the original version of why. That was my interest in uh, a protective field guide, if you will. But as it turns out, they have these other amazing properties as well, and that ties into biomimicry. Uh, what is unique about shark skin? They are made of enamel, the same as teeth. It's enamel over dentin, which is very, very different from a typical bony fish scale. Uh, they are, again, unique to the species, and they are the same shape as the teeth. They're just simply smaller. As the, as the skin stretches over the jaws, they enlarge for the teeth. And as far as these applications of biomimicry, I'll be telling you about two things that uh, we've known and two things that I'm working on right now. One is they reduce frictional drag. As this animal swims through the water, I'll show you some more pictures of these scales, but it creates little eddies, little currents of water that literally press against the skin, and it flattens out that layer that is juxtaposed to the skin, and it reduces drag, and it turns it into laminar flow. That's wonderful if you're a submarine designer or a yacht salesman or something like that. Uh, so I got a little bit of funding from the ONR to look into that a little bit further. The other is that, uh, as you probably know, bacteria are ubiquitous. They grow everywhere. You probably know, of course, that bacteria also lay down their own bedding, if you will, a biofilm or a sticky substance, and that's what they need to grow on. But we now know that that bacterial biofilm is also what fouling organisms like barnacles and algae need to adhere to before they can grow. 
So that, again, ties into biomimicry. Shark skin is relatively clean compared to the skin of a marine mammal, and it has a lot to do with that raised surface. It, it's contrary to what I would think. I would think that a raised surface would give you more area for biofilm, hence more bacteria, but it turns out to be just the reverse. The smoother the surface, the more easy bacteria are to lay down a biofilm, and then fouling organisms uh, come into that. There again, the uh, uh, Office of Naval Research is interested in that for fouling organisms, but also I got a little bit of funding through the SC Inbury because of the ability to suppress uh, biofilm formation on things like scalpel handles, uh, countertops in pharmacies, what have you. Uh, so that's how I, I funded this, and I'll tell you a little bit about the story behind the frictional drag and show you this uh, different skins, uh, and uh, I'll show you a couple of examples of the bacterial resistance that all comes out of those particular models. I've got kind of a mini slideshow of the who's who of the uh, species that I've worked on to date and where that's going into the future. I really only put three of them into this particular talk, but I'm trying to get all the species that are in the Gulf of Mexico somewhere built into this. I'll walk you through the PrEP procedure. I know everybody has looked at a lot of scanning electron micrographs, but the end product is wonderful. Uh, getting to that stage is a real pain in the neck because of all the, the PrEP stages that you go through. Uh, so I'll walk you through that. Um, fortunately, I've got a lot of students that do a lot of the, the grunt work anymore. Uh, but then it took us up to when we had these images, what do we do with them? Well, we have this theory of reduction of drag. Uh, so I'm going to talk about Reynolds' number. And this is where it gets really ugly because it's math. And uh, as I was telling uh, David, that is my Achilles heel in science. But I'll show you just basically there is, in fact, a workable formula that shows this reduction of drag. And that took me down another little rabbit hole uh, that I've been enjoying. I have a 3D printer that I've been using for other structures, but I got this idea, well, you know, you can scan something and, and print it, but there's no facility that I know of for scanning, uh, for taking a microscopic image. You can't scan something, I should say, microscopic, and then print it larger. So what I was working on is taking these actually uh, scanning electron micrographs that are, again, shot in the nano world, and then using mathematical modeling and scaling them up, converting them into STL files to where they could be printed. And I'll show you some of those. In fact, while I do that, I'll just send these around just to, for expedite time. These are 3D printed models that were based on actual scanning electron micrographs of shark skin. And the species is written on the back here. They're quasi-accurate, but uh, I'm getting better all the time. Bacterial resistance, uh, let me give you the back story on that when we get there. I'm going to base it on somebody else's model that had the right idea but the wrong interpretation of the experiment. And we'll talk a little bit about future applications where this is going and again where it's probably uh, fundable because at any institution it's always dollars that, that drive this uh, type of work. So here is again what is unique about the shark scale. Uh, they're unlike the tilios or the bony fish scale. They are enamel over dentin, so it's very much like your tooth. And there is no bone, of course, in sharks, so they stretch over the cartilage of the jaw. And as I said, they are identical in morphology. They're just bigger from mouth area towards the tail. And right above before where the tail attaches is where I always take these samples, so I have a consistent uh, uh, supply. By the way, we try to catch these. Uh, we get them in and out of the water as quickly as possible when we try not to harm them at all. Uh, so I'll show you some pictures of them being collected, but they were quick snip-snip back in the water. Uh, again, suspected that, well, they do, in fact, decrease frictional drag. I've got the mathematical evidence for that. This is uh, dermal denticles of a light micrograph. I think it's the only one I have in the whole slideshow that is of Squellus acanthius, the spiny dogfish. If you took an anatomy class, you most certainly dissected one of these. They've been used since like the 15th century for anatomical dissection. But you can see that they're very different. These are just cleared in glycerin and stained with alizarin red so that the, the calcium in the enamel pops out. But the center and the picture on your right, these, of course, are scanning electron micrographs, uh, respectively at 50 and at 500x magnification, just showing you the unique morphology and the idea of these ridges. So those little eddies are really what we're after. 
Uh, okay, so where does this tie into biomimicry? Again, biomimicry, biological materials that uh, have uh, functional application, mimicking biological materials for functional application. The, the poster child, of course, would be uh, uh, vel Velcro, you know, the little bristles and Velcro. Uh, well, marketing steps into the fact here, and Speedo, I think others did it as well, but Speedo began to market what they called their LZR line uh, of wetsuits, or basically swimsuits, to supposedly reduce the frictional drag on swimmers. And this is their little marketing ploy there. There's their uh, insert. You can see on the, hey, I got it, okay. On that side is their little brand, and if you were to look at these under high magnification, they just basically look like little glue tabs with slots between them. What they were mimicking them on, they're not exactly modeling, they're not exactly the same shape as the actual shark skin, that's what I was after, but they have a pattern that has been inspired, if you will, by that, and that's where these things kicked in. Well, they were banned in 2009, I have no idea why, because it doesn't work. Uh, if you take the fastest swimmer ever, and I guess we could now argue that's maybe Michael Phelps at the present, uh, he can wear that and it's not going to have any different at all unless you were to surgically turn his hips 90 degrees and now he's kicking uh, side by side like a shark. And then those little eddies would press in uh, on these little furrows between and that does compress the water and reduce frictional drag. So it was a total marketing hype like I guess most of this stuff is and it did not work. Okay. So some of the ones that I worked on to date, uh, this is a spinner shark, uh, very, very common in the Gulf when you get offshore in, the, in obviously the bluer water, so this is out near the Sargasso Sea. Uh, small species, they're, they're not dangerous, so named because they fly out of the water and they spin, so anglers love to catch them as well. Uh, there is under 100x magnification and 500x magnification, their unique pattern. So again, if you were doing this on ship, you could cut that off with a single razor blade as fast as your boat can get back to shore 30 minutes later, somebody on dock, even with a portable SEM, could give you that particular image as opposed to the time it takes to get molecular biology data. There is, who'd have thunk it, right? A black nose shark, an inshore species from the Gulf again, relatively low and relatively high magnification. Similar, but if you look at the measurement between these peaks and valleys, they're different. And again, you have kind of a scalloped edge here as opposed to a subdued edge here. Little subtleties like that that you'll notice on every different shark species. There's 380 different species, and I, I'm fairly certain that you would find the, if you knew what to look for, you would find the subtle differences in all of these. Uh, great hammerhead. Um, not very common in the Gulf, and I don't have a picture of a great hammerhead other than a dead one that was laying in a boat, and that's upsetting enough. But again, characteristic, look at the deep notches here, relatively low compared to trough peaks and valleys that we'll measure. I'll show you that a little bit later, low and high mag. And one that is common in the Gulf, if you're out fishing within about the 12 mile radius, you'll catch certainly some of these. People sometimes call them bonnet heads, but this is a little bit different. That's the scalloped hammerhead. It has these little cookie cutter bites in there. Relatively small, very, very common species. Again, pull it up on boat. Hopefully it's not bleeding under the jaw, which means you've cut the heart. And if it is not, you can quickly take a little swatch from the caudal peduncle, pitch it overboard, and it'll grow that back again because it is part of the epidermis. Looks similar but there's different measurements here, morphometric measurements that would allow you to take that and simply say, yes, it's in the same sphere in a family, but it's obviously not great hammerhead, it is this and that. And then the tiger shark, uh, they're fairly common in the Gulf if there's a shipwreck, I'm not, not, a, not an immediate shipwreck, if there's something su submerged, they're relatively easy to find and dive boats go out there regularly. Uh, this is a young one because of the stripes, but Again, very, very characteristic. These are, I guess, my personal favorites. They really look like spades or something like that. And another common species, this one's just an aquarium, through the aquarium wall shot of a bull shark, kind of the robust body that gives it its name. But again, nobody could confuse this with this in terms of the shape, sort of that Batman-like uh, image. In fact, one of the uh, scales that is floating around amongst you is one of these uh, uh, bull shark images. Okay. So, still working up that image bank. Uh, I've got about, I think, 17 species now, and that is pretty much exhausting the gulf, but they haven't all been worked up yet. 
All right, so how do we prepare them? Well, again, we cut the skin from a consistent area. You can take it anywhere you like, from the fin, from the side of the body, but I wanted a certain focal point always to use, and that way if I were to travel to the West Coast again and I didn't have time to collect, I could go to the you know, Cal Academy and say, can I take a one centimeter skin squatch from the cuddle peduncle? And they'll probably say no, but that's why there's, uh, you know, some species that. Uh, the ones that I worked on mostly were uh, Carcharhinus acronatus, the black nose. They're really pretty sharks. Uh, the Lowenii, the scalloped hammerhead, because they're common. And this is the most common species in the Gulf. If you throw a menhaden, you'll catch one of these things. They're all small, relatively uh, small species. The trick is getting them up out of the water before they exhaust themselves because they can die from lactic acid toxin. Knowing how to hold them so that you don't hemorrhage the internal organs. And then again, as long as they're not bleeding profusely and you get it back in the water again, they'll do just fine. It's like trout and release, uh, trout catch and release. So we cut off a little bit of skin, uh, put them in alcohol, got them back to the lab uh, probably even a month later because I've been down there for quite some time. Uh, then they have to be cleaned because there's a lot of junk on there, whether it's mucus or you know planktonic matter, what have you. Uh, so the best thing to do is we just put them upside down in a sonicator in absolute ethanol and run them for about 10 minutes and all the little chatter falls to the bottom, along with some of the looser scales. Uh, so you'll see holes in some of the preparations, but that's basically just where a scale that was going to be shed anyway has fallen off. Then they have to be air dried. Um, the trick was not to get them to wrap up, so we'd simply sandwich them between two microscope slides with a quarter on top till they dry. Uh, mount them on stubs and then coat them in a gold platinum alloy because these are going into the electron microscope and we want the, the scattering pattern, the secondary pattern of the scattering electrons to give you the image. You can coat them with many things, but this one came with that gold target, so gold platinum target. So that's the whole prep procedure. Uh, doesn't take long to cut this off, does not take long really to sonicate them, to mount them, to coat them. It really doesn't take long to uh, get your images but you want all your images lying in the same plane, all for the same degree of magnification. Uh, that's where most of the work comes in. And then, of course, the math. Uh, this is my uh, SEM. It's a really nice one. Uh, uh, this is the, the Joel 3900. This has uh, this X-ray diffraction uh, beam here, so I can not only look at things under very high resolution magnification, but I can hit it with an X-ray beam and get an elemental spectrum readout. You know, is it iron? Is it calcium? what is in there, and that's something I'll maybe I'll talk about at a future date. Uh, but the specimens are loaded here. This is the electron gun. It'll accelerate them through the vacuum column that you focus with a series of magnets, essentially. And uh, what you see is what you get. It appears here on the uh, screen. Uh, we can increase our magnification, X, Y, Z rotation here. And this, this unit will go up to about 100 and yeah, they, on, the, on paper about 130, maybe 140,000 X magnification, but I'm shooting in the realm of about three, 4,000. But uh, I try to put that into perspective for my students because they're working on this. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I start out by asking them questions like, you know, how many tons do you weigh? And, you know, so they, they understand that they have to process this in the nano world. You know, how many miles tall are you? I get them thinking in the nano world, and then I give them a simple uh, sample of blood. Uh, we can't work with fluids anymore, but a simple sample of blood, of course, is red, could be ink, could be paint, who knows, nail polish. When they make a typical histology slide, you can tell then, of course, that blood is cellular. You can see the serum and these little tiny concave dots, or oval dots for fish blood, and that's about all you can see the best resolution we can get with the light microscopes that I have. But under this system, I can blow them up like a 15-inch truck tire. And if you get lucky, which you usually do, there's a tear in the membrane. You can look right inside and see the two sides of the membrane, how they're held together with lipid. You can see the coiled globular protein of the hemoglobin. You could hit that hemoglobin with the edax and get iron. It's really a, a very powerful tool, but it's just a great big camera. Uh, the difference is that you're not seeing the real image. It's like watching TV. You're looking at a, I still can't figure out how TV works, but this somehow image comes through air, space, and you get a reconstructed image of a horse running across your stream. Well, you're getting a digitally reconstructed image of whatever is here. 
and the computer is not at your feet. It has a built-in image analysis program. It's really cool. Um, this is all 3D. The, the transmissions are, are 2D. Uh, so then, again, some of those scales look pretty similar, right? Like the bonnet head, the great hammer head, that there are subtle differences, and that's where the morphometric measurements come in. So in this particular one, again, you can measure anything you like, really. You could measure peak to peak, how many peaks are present. Uh, you can rotate this 90 degrees, and you can get an idea of the depth of the trough. Again, there's the smooth versus subtle versus serrated edges, how many uh, furrows are cut in there. Uh, with a different tool, I can do actually perimeter on here, uh, cir circumference. Uh, but when I took all those particular measurements, that still wasn't enough to allow me to convert it into a 3D image. So what we had to do was then go to geometry. And by looking at all these measurements, such as combining surface area with number of peaks, separate measurements for the jagged edge, length, number, uh, furrow, using a very ugly geometric formula, it came up with, uh, we modeled it basically after a Lay's potato chip, and that's how we, we did the initial measurements. We came up with a formula where we could plug in these measurements, and you can get a true three-dimensional measurement of any of the shark skins that negates the size. And that was then allowable to plug into, uh, use a little bit of Mathematica for that, which is, uh, it's pretty user-friendly. It's a real button-pushing program, which was good for me. There we go. Uh, Mathematica would, I keep leaning on it with my elbow, Mathematica would give me the measurements to convert this into a uh, STL file for printing. But before that, we wanted to look at this idea of physical Reynolds number that is uh, calculating for a reduction of drag, and then we could print these 3D. So ignore all this. That gave me a headache putting it together. Uh, all you need to know is the green here and the green here. You know, again, Reynolds number is a physicist term. If it is above or below a certain figure, it either means turbulence or uh, non-turbulence. When you take that Reynolds number, and you interface it with the measurements, the geometric measurements that we took of the scale, it converts it into dyne, which is the pressure that's on the lateral surface. And if you can see that, again, ignore all of that because I do anymore. If you simply cut down to the chase here, this is the calculation for laminar flow for, I just willy-nilly picked four foot length as a, as a shark length and plugged it into these. I just willy-nilly again chose speeds, swimming speeds of a mile and a half per hour and six mile per hour. We can swim at our best maybe about three. Uh, just plug those in and you can basically see what happens. Without the, uh, without plugging in the uh, calculations for laminar flow, there is a bit of resistance here that would, would certainly not suggest a reduction of drag. That would actually show frictional drag. But when you plug that together, it reduces the Reynolds number way back to something that is a fraction here. And again, the bottom line is the faster they swim, the lower is the Reynolds number, the lower is the reduction of drag. So that shark again, if it is cruising, there is this little eddy that is pressing against the lateral scale that is reducing the friction level, and that reduces laminar, that creates laminar flow. If it was a smooth surface, you wouldn't have those eddies formed, then you would have frictional drag. Speed up the swimming, it speeds up the eddies, the Reynolds number decreases further, and again, results in greater reduction of friction, and now it is laminar flow. And that's why they work, and that's why it might work if you could swim six miles per hour, and again, turn your hips 90 degrees to the side and swim this way rather than this way. But Speedo didn't know that. <laughs> Yeah. All right, now the fun part, and this is really where it got really difficult. Uh, you can buy 3D printers really cheap anymore. You can download you know, gobs of STL files from the internet and print anything you want from little Eiffel Tower earrings to little cars. Uh, but there's not much on there in terms of uh, shark skin, and there's nothing on there in terms of a microscopic image. So my task was to take these microscopic images that I've blown up on the EM, measured, and then ca calculate from those measurements an STL file. And that's where it took a little bit of work. Uh, Mathematica worked okay because it's a real button pusher. Uh, I'm not very good at anything computer related, so fortunately I have a son who's a uh, landscape architect, and he was pretty good with taking these numbers 
and he helped me convert those into STL files, which were great. Then you can simply send them away for printing or plug them into your MakerBot or AIO or whatever you might have, and it printed those models that you're looking at now. So uh, they're very really rough and crude. Uh, they need to be done more and done better. But nevertheless, that was kind of where the 3D printing of this goes. Now that I have these, and they're physically large, that's perfect for taking downstairs to the physics department and say, hey, put it in one of your little flow chambers, and let's in fact measure the frictional drag across this surface, turn it over and do it again on the flat surface. And the theory, of course, is that it's going to reduce frictional drag here, flip it over and smooth, and it's going to increase frictional drag. Uh, as far as the other part, again, the biofilm formation, I'm going to draw back on an older paper from Mann et al. in 2014. And what they were looking at is, again, the idea that they, they know of the reduction of bacterial growth on uh, rougher surfaces. They were looking basically at that. And again, you can see where there is the smooth uh, versus the uh, micro pattern. There we go. Sorry. Smooth versus the micro pattern here. And they were looking at bacterial growth simply on a raised surface versus a smooth surface. It isn't biomimicry. They weren't modeling this on anything. They just noted in 2014 that a rough surface had less bacterial growth. And that was, again, the kind of the head scratcher as to why. Where that ended up was a company called Sharklet Technologies. Again, didn't model shark skin. They got inspired by shark skin, and they made this particular substance, which then we tried and we drew a little bacteria on and we found, we found reduced bacterial growth. So the question remained, does actual shark skin, as opposed to something that is just modeled after shark skin, will it work? Here's the process. We took gutta percha, a dental product, depressed in there the shark skin so that the rough surface is now an Im impression here, filled that with a resin, uh, electron microscopy resin, peeled it apart, and now you have a plastic model of actual shark skin, which we could then simply put in a nutrient broth, which we seeded with a bacterium, wait and get your results. So there again, this is relatively low magnification. This was just sort of the smooth surface of sandpaper and the rough surface of sandpaper, and you're seeing again the idea of bacterial growth on the smooth surface, a little bit suppressed on the rough surface, and then the actual shark skin. This is an actual cast of shark skin that was made in the resin, and again, we were looking at bacterial growth. We do have a little bit of bacterial growth here, but most of that is a very, very, very clean surface compared to the smooth undercoating of the, the sandpaper that you looked at. Okay? So in a nutshell, it does, again, work. We looked at about a 50% average, and that was just a real quick, uh, dirty experiment that is still under process. And how can it be utilized? Well, uh, some data that I just pulled off. These uh, HCAPs, the infections of those, as all of you know, run rampant. Uh, there is an estimate of between this, you know, this amount of dollars per patient uh, based on dealing with these HAIs. So if we can model a pill counter surface or a scalpel handle or a tabletop where pills are being counted, you name it, uh, that has the surface that is modeled after a shark skin. If it works in the laboratory, it would probably work in a situation like that. So that's where I'm going with funding next uh, for this. Uh, and of course, I want to compare these other species. And I also need to compare different bacteria. Bacteria are not all equal, as you know. So we'll try different species of bacteria. Uh, some of my able-bodied assistants, they're holding them in the politically correct manner. Uh, they were all, again, scraped and released. And uh, I could go on and on for the thanks about all that. And I'll just show you again the play part of this. When you have this, what can you do with it when you're untrained as an artist and there are new rules? You can go absolutely crazy. And I just decorate my lab with these so that students come in and they have less uh, training than I do, so they want to make something similar, and that gets them interested in following some work like that. That's tiger shark before, tiger shark after, and this was uh, the scalloped hammerhead before, rotated after. It looked to me like flames, and uh, that's yeah, that's that's basically uh, what we do. Well, sorry.